Thank you very much. If I knew you were going to read the entire introduction, I would have written something shorter. So I do apologize for that. Um, can I have the first slide then, please? So um, I'm going to talk to you about evolution today. Um, but of course, one of the most important evolutions is what you see in the bottom of the slide here. And that is uh, the evolution from the 1996, 97, 98 period when a, a guy, senior at the local university, had an idea, an outrageous idea, to create a biotechnology company in Fargo. I was rather skeptical at the time. But with his colleagues, John Ballantyne, and a variety of other colleagues and friends of mine, I was fortunate to see the creation and the development and the evolution of Aldevron from those early days uh, till the culmination, as it were, in our visit yesterday in building one, as Jenny pointed out. So I'm looking forward to the next 20 years, and I hope to participate in the 40th anniversary celebration of um, Aldevron and breakthroughs resulting from the technologies that they've helped catalyze and that they will continue to uh, contribute to in the next several decades, I'm sure. I was surprised whenever I was invited by James Brown to, to be a speaker here at the dates that were chosen. Uh, I found them very unusual uh, for a couple of reasons. And actually, I guess I can run the slides myself, can't I? Yeah. But I realized soon after that this actually, these two dates were the two most important dates of the year. Of course, yesterday was the election. And uh, I, I suppose having the meeting on election day was to encourage us to vote early, which I hope most of you did. Uh, but then I realized that, of course, today is Michael Chambers' birthday. <laughs> so I'm not going to sing, but Mike, uh, happy birthday. I hope many more, hope to see you on many more. And just how much it's been a pleasure to be a friend and colleague of yours over the years and to really salute you for this extraordinary work that you've done. And I know everyone in, the, in this room and outside this room appreciates all, of this, all that you've done to make Aldevron uh, the company that it is today. Directed evolution, in case you haven't been reading the scientific news over the last couple of weeks, just won the Nobel Prize in 2018 in chemistry. And the winner of the Nobel Prize uh, for directed evolution of enzymes and binding proteins was Dr. Frances Arnold, who's a professor at Caltech. Uh, and uh, she, the, the prize was given for that, this, for that directed evolution and phage display. She won the prize for uh, directed evolution and George Smith and Greg Winter won it for phage display. But uh, the scientific background paper that the Nobel Committee put out makes quite clear that there was another person involved in the very early phases of the work on directed evolution. And I just want to point out that Pim Stemmer, who's the inventor of the technology that I'll be talking about today, along with Francis Arnold, won the 2011 Draper Prize, which I believe is the National Academy of Engineering, and it's considered to be the Nobel Prize of Engineering. Pim Stemmer unfortunately died five years ago, and as you know, uh, the Nobel Prize, except in one odd occasion, is never given posthumously. The committee didn't realize that the winner had died that week. That's why it was on one occasion recently given to someone who was no longer alive. Uh, so there will be an enduring mystery as to whether or not Pim Stemmer would have won the Nobel Prize or not. And Pim was one of the founders of the original Maxigen. And as the National Academy of Sciences, or Press rather, said some years ago that PIMS technology was a revolutionary method for directed evolution that involved repeated cycles of in vitro homologous recombination. And indeed, PIMS insight was that creating diversity, which is a genetic diversity, which is an integral part of directed evolution, as I'll show you, was in fact, could, could be most efficiently uh, done by mimicking the way diversity is created in nature, and that is largely by homologous recombination and not, as is often thought, by spontaneous mutations. So Pim and his colleagues, uh, first at Affimax and then at Maxigen, found a way to affect homologous recombination 
in a very uh, detailed way, or in a very complex way, let's say, in a test tube. And that was uh, the origin of the molecular breeding technology that we've been using for uh, nearly 20 years. And I've been fortunate in, in my time at Maxigen to work with Pim to uh, appreciate the extraordinary creativity that he had. And he was also a very accomplished serial entrepreneur. And the scientific community and the biotech community certainly lost a visionary in uh, 2013 when he died at uh, the age of, I think, 56 or 57. So molecular breeding then is, is the, the approach to directed evolution that I'm going to focus on today. And directed evolution in general, for those of you who are not familiar with the, the approach, basically consists of two things. One is creating genetic diversity, as I've just alluded to, and the second part is screening that genetic diversity. Arguably, the screening is more labor intensive, more costly, and obviously specific to the particular problem that you're trying to solve. And, and so I'll, I'll focus on the diversity creation mechanism and show you some examples from widely different fields uh, of the kinds of screens one can do. But the goal is to find an optimized candidate, that is to say, modify the naturally occurring protein such that it can serve the biotechnology or the pharmaceutical industry as a product that one can use in the field of human uh, medicine or veterinary medicine or agriculture. Uh, because natural, the natural products and natural proteins that one can isolate uh, and express from genes don't always satisfy the criteria needed for a real useful product. Anyway, referring to the diversity creation part, the in vitro homologous DNA recombination technique that uh, Pim Stemmer developed in the uh, early 1900s, yes, 1900s, 1990s, sorry, um, was, was actually uh, quickly, it was quickly realized that although one could use the standard method of random uh, mutagenesis and recombine that random, the random mutations, it was much more effective if the input diversity was coming from naturally occurring diversity, that is to say, the amino acid differences between sets of wild type genes that obviously are coding for functional diversity. So these days we make what we call high quality functional libraries of chimeric variants, usually starting with naturally occurring diversity. And this has a number of, of advantages and, and basically it allows proteins, it's actually a relatively conserved strategy, a conserved way of making diversity uh, while not lacking at all in the theoretical combinatorial possibilities that result. But the high quality of libraries, which is to say libraries in which the majority of the variants are functional, comes from the fact that when we're beginning with functional diversity. Now, one way to look at this is to uh, go to Wikipedia, <laughs> read their definition of directed evolution, and to uh, follow along on this landscape slide, which, is, which comes from a, a thesis um, of a British student a number of years ago, and which is actually very effective in illustrating what we're trying to do. But as Wikipedia says, directed evolution is a method, it's a laboratory method for protein engineering that mimics natural selection, but that selection is imposed by the user. That is to say, one identifies the characteristics needed for a particular product, or in, in other terms, the target product profile, and devises a series of assays that are going to down-select the library as a function of those criteria, more or less stringently, until ultimately you test uh, a number of candidates, and that's the key because it is a numbers game in a sense, and one tests a number of candidates in those conditions that most closely mimic the final conditions of usage. If that is a product that is going into humans, then ultimately multiple candidates can be screened in humans knowing that they meet uh, all the criteria that you can think of prior to actually testing them in humans. Obviously, if products are being used in different scenarios, uh, those final process-related conditions can be a lot simpler. Anyway, the, the idea of a protein landscape whereby one is looking at sequence space in two axes and fitness in the, in the third z-axis uh, can be approached, or rather, one, the goal is to go from position one or somewhere low on the fitness landscape to some peak Everest uh, position on the landscape, which is a position of, of high fitness. And if one starts with a single sequence as done in classic uh, directed evolution, and then does random mutagenesis, you end up 
with a large number of variants, but very closely spaced around the original sequence within this sequence landscape. And if you, are, if you have bad luck and you begin with a sequence which resides, let's say, in the region of Fargo over here, which is very flat, then you can see that the, the challenge of getting to Mount Everest is going to be even greater. So the recombinational approach, the molecular breeding approach uh, that we use involves us choosing a variety of genes that can be relatively broadly uh, distributed throughout sequence space. They're, 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 we choose uh, sequences, for example, that have um, 80 or 70 percent sequence identity and use those as starting material to perform homologous recombination in vitro. And what that gives you is a sparse representation of uh, variants across sequence space, but allows you to identify after some simple screening approaches, those molecules, those variants that are in the region of improved, uh, improved functionality, improved fitness. And you can then take those improved variants from one round, make another library, and in this, in, as you can see, hone in more and more densely on the regions of high fitness until you've eventually chosen one or more uh, candidates that appear to be uh, nearing the kind of fitness that you define or that you believe you can define as the fitness, the specifications, the target product profile needed for what you're trying to accomplish in terms of having a product candidate. And of course, uh, other techniques can be used to modify the proteins at this point. Uh, there are various methods such as secondary modifications to increase half-life and, and things of that sort, or you can do other mutagenesis type techniques. But the directed evolution approach using molecular breeding is one of the more rapid ways of getting to something that is in the realm of the fitness needed for a given product. So to put it in other, uh, to show it in a different form, here again is directed evolution and its two components, diversity creation and screening. Uh, the diversity creation involves in the laboratory a number of steps, including some QC. The screening is normally envisioned as a tiered process whereby you do an initial pre-screening to quickly down-select the library to its functional components using some simple assay and you devise a series of assays that are lower and lower in throughput, but higher and higher in relevance as regards the final product characteristics you're looking for. And as I said, we use high quality diversity for, for molecular breeding, and by high quality we mean functional diversity, and that functional diversity normally comes from phylogeny, although there are other ways of, of accessing diversity which is functional, such as site saturation of each amino acid position in a protein to identify those amino acid changes that are at least compatible with function, if not providing any large gain in function. And that's, that's a costly and lengthy approach, but it's certainly been done in some cases as a way of generating functional diversity that can be used to make additional libraries. And one thing to uh, keep in mind also that perhaps will simplify things for you is that the molecular breeding technology is really based on the traditional principles of breeding. And I'll illustrate that in a moment. Uh, but you can use many of the same terms that you use in classical breeding, such as parents, F1 progeny, brother-sister mating, back cross, out cross, et cetera. So finally, in this introductory part, another final way of looking at it, here we have several genes uh, coming from a family of homologous genes. They uh, all probably perform the same function, although that's not even necessarily uh, true or needed. They certainly have sequence uh, similarity, and by making uh, and by forcing recombination, homologous recombination to occur in vitro, we can make very complex chimeras, and it's not easy to represent them here, but because they are very complex, but it's not just one or two crossovers, as it were, but there are multiple uh, pieces that compose these chimeras. That is your library, that is screened for uh, some function, and upon identifying some molecules, some variants that are improved, at least partially, if not completely, uh, in the, in the pro property you need, you can then use those additional, you can use those identified candidates to make additional libraries in a recursive fashion. And as you'll see, this recursive use can be extremely powerful. So we use homologous sequences and a lot of it, diversity, because the high level of functionality is key to making good libraries. By not trying to focus on a specific region of a protein to improve a function that we believe is important, this is a much more holistic approach. This high diversity results as it were, in multiple solutions to the problem, that evolution in general doesn't follow one pathway. There are many ways to get to the same result. And so this allows you very, very typically 
to have multiple candidates that are improved in a function that can be used for recursive rounds of directed evolution. And if one follows this along logically, you eventually have multiple candidates at every step of development uh, so that the inevitable attrition that occurs uh, does not result in simply the project dying, which is often what happens in, company, in companies or in situations where there's one lead candidate. If it fails at any point in development, the program dies. And this approach is not at all incompatible with mutagenesis and rational design approaches. Uh, we typically do not require any rational design process because our approach is, well, not irrational, but stochastic in a way that is beneficial to the overall, uh, uh, overall process of what we're trying to accomplish. So this for me is a classic example of uh, the use of directed evolution using the molecular breeding approach whereby the, uh, the ag group within Maxigen uh, wanted to find an enzyme that would detoxify glyphosate, which is the component of Roundup, which many of you know is a weed killer. There's no natural enzyme that carries out this function, but of course there are multiple enzymes that can acetylate uh, various substrates. And so they found some uh, proteins from soil bacteria that had a little bit of activity in, gly in acetylating glyphosate and eventually used that to make a series of libraries in which they uh, made a single library, found some improved mo molecules, did brother-sister matings, made recursive libraries, but eventually seemed to come to a plateau because the diversity was very limited at that point. They went to the databases and found sequences which were not necessarily functionally related to this enzyme because this enzyme doesn't exist in nature, but had sequence, uh, sequence homology sufficient to provide further diversity to the process. And this outcross then spiked in new diversity and multiple rounds of evolution, directed evolution were carried out after that to eventually achieve an enzyme uh, with an activity that was more than sufficient to function in the field. Now, you might say, well, this is an enzyme, it's a simple chemical transformation, it shouldn't be a particularly difficult problem to solve. So let's look at some other problems where the uh, mechanism of action is not so obvious and where the problem to be solved doesn't immediately spur any ideas as to how you could solve it in a rational fashion. One example is that of interferon. Uh, here, alpha interferon was uh, evolved using purely the sequence diversity present in the human genome of interferon genes. And the ability of interferon to stimulate antiviral activity in some human cell lines was increased about a hundredfold over the most active naturally occurring interferon. But interferon also has a cell proliferative property, which is thought to be related, or an anti-proliferative property action, which is thought to be related to some of the secondary effects that, it's, that occur when it's used as a, in, as a drug. But in, in spite of the fact that there was a hundredfold or more increase in the antiviral activity of this interferon alpha, the anti-proliferative activity was not changed. So that shows that in a complex process where there's binding involved and signal transduction involved, that without having any idea what mechanism needs to be specifically improved, you can get such an improvement and separate activities within a protein uh, one from the other so that you can specifically evolve one particular set of activities which might be beneficial. Now, an even more complex situation in terms of being a black box is that of immunogenicity. There's very little rational thinking to explain why a given protein or a given modality results in high or low immunogenicity. So in an early project that uh, carried out based on some, a, a SIB model system I had been working on for a long time, we tried to evolve the hepatitis B surface antigen, which is the basis for the commercial vaccine, and it's been well studied, and there are assay kits that you can use to measure antibodies in very relevant ways. We undertook to evolve this by keep, simply keeping the major immunodominant epitope constant and allowing the rest of the sequence to vary using homologs from other hepatinovirus sequences. The screen, after, uh, after having simply verified that clones were um, functional and made protein in cell culture, the screen was directly screening for immunogenicity in mice. And we carried out that assay in about 300 animals in each round. After one round of directed evolution, we found some improved activities. Not, not many variants were improved, and the improvement was not enormous. Uh, but we use those to make additional libraries, and in the second round, we identified more variants with improved activity, and the best variant had higher activity than those 
found in the first round. So this is a very typical result coming from the recursive application of directed evolution, but in a very complex situation where we have no idea really what accounts for uh, immunogenicity. We could have, there would have been no way to approach this easily in a, in a, in a rational design fashion. I want to just mention AAV, not because I have any results to show here today, but just to point out that uh, here's another problem that may require the simultaneous optimization of multiple parameters. On the one hand, modifying the capsid can allow you to increase activity, improve assembly, in other words, perhaps stability, modify tropism, and increase or decrease immunogenicity, depending on what you're looking for. In addition, of course, the virus is carrying a transgene, and the transgene itself can be improved, or the control elements can be improved by a directed evolution process. And during the production of AAV, in addition to the other helper functions which we're addressing in separate, separate projects uh, coming from adeno, adenovirus, the, evolu the replicase protein, the rep gene of AAV, can uh, certainly be uh, a target of improvement in terms of accuracy to allow for the replicase to excise just the AAV sequences from the plasma backbone, backbone and not excise any extraneous sequences. So what makes us think that we could uh, address a problem like this with the molecular breeding directed evolution approach? And I'll illustrate that by a project that was actually done by Janelle Miranaka, who's Maxigen's current director of operations, but this was in a time when she was a denizen of the laboratory and was still doing laboratory bench science. We've been working on dengue vaccines for a number of years, and we came to the conclusion that the best vaccine would probably be one based on virus-like particles. And it's a very common, uh, common tendency in vaccinology these days to try to make virus-like particles because some of the very best vaccines that are out there, the hepatitis B vaccine, the HPV vaccine, are based on virus-like particles. Unfortunately, dengue uh, is poorly expressed in terms of making virus-like particles, so we address this problem in a directed evolution way. What was required was that we introduce the gene for the polyprotein, encoding just for the polyprotein components with no no, none of the other genomic components. But this polyprotein gene needed to be expressed, processed in terms of proteolytic cleavage, second, receive secondary modifications, be transported through the ER and Golgi, assemble, insert itself partly in the membrane, and be exocytosed, a very complex process, and we were not about to address each of those steps independently. So we just used a library by, uh, by isolating individual plasmids, transfecting cells, and measuring the output in what was basically a very low throughput kind of screen, but because we had uh, libraries in which the, co the variants were, the, the proportion variance was very highly functional, we were able to do a relatively low throughput screen. So the individual transfections then were measured uh, first by secretion in ELISA type assay. Those that showed some production of protein were then done, uh, were then analyzed in a simple uh, cushion uh, centrifugation step, identified those that uh, pelleted some macromolecular structure, eventually ran some of these on the, the ultimate low throughput assay, which is a sucrose gradient and identified those that were clearly forming virus-like particles, had a certain density, did not have a lot of free protein, did not have a lot of aggregates, and found a number of molecules that were improved with respect to expression. And that's shown at the bottom here on this gel, and won't go over all the details, but the bottom line is that the several control wild-type dengue sequences that we were using as references that we got from the Navy, who's been working on dengue for decades, were very poorly expressed, whereas this simple experiment of directed evolution allowed us to identify multiple variants that were forming virus-like particles, bonafide vi virus-like particles, and were very well expressed and were clearly in a realm of uh, expression levels that could be used to begin a commercial development pro process based on these sorts of results. So I want to end then in the last 50 seconds just to provide this summary for you that the examples I've shown today, and as well as others that are published that we've, we've worked on uh, in the laboratory, uh, allow one to consider improvements in the areas of activity, solubility, secretion, specificity of, say, substrate specificity, expression, resistance to uh, inhibitors, thermostability, aggregation, assembly, processing affinity, immunogenicity. It, but the most important thing is that you create a pr target product profile that you understand in advance 
that what you screen for is what you're going to get. And if you keep that in mind in carrying out a directed evolution uh, program, you can improve one or more properties simultaneously and really address many of the shortcomings that have traditionally been uh, showstoppers for the development of pharmaceutical products. So I'll stop there and be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Bob. Uh, do we have any questions? Oh, oh, go ahead. Robert, great talk. Thank you. Uh, I, I noticed you answered, you partially answered the question I was going to ask, which is in your screening tree, can you put multiple, look for multiple uh, uh, changes while you're doing the shuffling? Mm -hmm. um, first of all, are these uh, AAVs available? Are, are, are these items that you're, that you're selling? And uh, is it possible that um, uh, in doing your screening trees that uh, these can be done st simultaneously or you're doing them uh, sequentially? You can certainly screen multiple parameters at, at once, which is obviously is advantageous. Sometimes it's simply not possible to have mul be able to s perform assays on multiple parameters in the same high throughput fashion, so you end up often doing it serially. Uh, the the in various projects and that I've alluded to or showed as examples, um, in, in many ways are, are custom because we you know we need to interact with the people who are going to develop the product as or the, the protein as it were as a product to understand what their specifications are, what their pain points are, what we need to improve and such. So we don't necessarily have a catalog of items we sell because we're we're really trying to custom design and custom optimize proteins for a particular purpose. D does that answer your question? Yes. Uh, okay. Another one that you're bringing up is, uh, is there a limitation uh, to your screening by the cell line? Is there, is there something you can do to customize the cell as well as, mm -hmm. the, okay. as the virus? So screening is a whole discussion <laughs> in, an, in and of itself, and that, that's one aspect. But uh, clever thinking in screening is, is really, I think, what makes a, a good project. And that's a, another area where, boy, as a, as a service company, we interact closely with our customers, not so much to uh, put ourselves in a position to do all the screening, although we certainly can, but to uh, try to explain to them some of the concepts of screening, some of the reagents they might need, some of the assays they might want to implement, and at what throughput, what kind of robotics might be involved. We, tr we try to enter into that kind of detailed discussion because that is critical for the success of a project. One, one last question, if I might. Uh, in, um, uh, I, I forgot. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. It's like Rick Perry, third, third thing. Whoops. <laughs> James? Thanks, Bob, for that, that great talk. Um, you know, the, the breeding sort of concepts have been around for a while, obviously recognized with the Nobel Prize, which is, um, you know, certainly in order for this sort of thing. When you look at, say, the, the last few years, even, even into the future, the near future with, say, bioinformatics and things like that, what, what are the types of, you know, discoveries or technologies that you see that are evolving that are going to make the underlying technique even better? Are, are there mm -hmm. things out there that, that we can expect to see that's going to make this even a more approachable thing, even if it's like, you know, screening better and screen, being able to screen more uh, candidates or, or where, where's, the, where's the field going, so to speak? Mm -hmm. Certainly the field has already uh, taken a bifurcation toward the bioinformatics approach. And uh, a lot of companies invested a lot of effort in academic groups as well, a lot of effort in, in this aspect. But you know, ab initio prediction of protein structure is really still an early, in its early infancy. And you know, we're not convinced that the bioinformatic tools that exist today uh, can beat, as it were, uh, just this straightforward approach. That said, the kind of information you, you can extract from a given library is probably tremendously useful in identifying uh, features of the protein that, that can be used to train, say, a machine learning algorithm. And so th there'll definitely be a lot of uh, a lot of progress in that area, and certainly the, you know, the computational power needed is usually enormous, but that's also a problem that's being solved. So I, I think we can look forward to, I think we can look forward to a lot of advances on that end, but we do tend to be a bit old fashioned, and we, we think that, you know, that there's, 
we, we, can, we can provide some of the same advantages that the bioinformatics people believe they can provide. The, the goal of bioinformatics is to reduce the number of things you have to screen. And we do that sort of intrinsically by using high quality libraries. great to see this going. I like your phrase old-fashioned, you know, uh, 10 years ago. Um, but uh, speaking of breakthroughs, how can we apply your genetic uh, tools and manipulations to RNA vaccines? To RNA vaccines? Yeah. Uh, making, for example, predicting a better VLP that comes out. Some of the uh, mm -hmm. sequences do make VLP spontaneously, some do not. Mm -hmm. I mean, is this something that you could envision using your technology for? I'm sorry, do you, are you referring to making RNA as the vaccine moiety Correct. or using or vaccines for RNA viruses? <laughs> using uh, RNA as the vaccine moiety. Okay. So, I mean, the, the, you know, the RNA is hopefully going to recapitulate, what, recapitulate what's in the DNA, so your screen would consist of you know, making the plasmid, transcribing the RNA and using the RNA in your assay uh, and identifying those that are coding. You know, again, you... For example, it's an important point that we, we never change horses in the middle of the stream. In other words, if we're screening using a plasmid, the plasmid should be the product. We don't screen as, as a plasmid and say, okay, now we'll just make the recombinant protein and everything will be cool. So you want to screen with a moiety which is going to be your product. And so in this case, it would be library, plasmid, transcript, RNA transcript, screen with the RNA. And then you'll find both a sequence, a, an amino acid sequence which meets your purposes as, as well as one that functions well as an RNA vaccine. So I think that's the way to envision it. And that's the kind of discussion that we typically have with our partners uh, in, in terms of designing a screen. Great, thank you. Okay, we have time for one more question. Uh, sorry, um, so Pim spent many years working with DARPA. And during that time, he was known for some really wild ideas. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could maybe tell us the wildest idea that Pim ever had uh, while you were working with him. I'm not sure if it came from him, but there was an idea once of a bacteria that would oscillate and that when once put on the moon would, you know, flash maxigen, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, well, that, that concludes our question and answer for this session. Please help me again in uh, thanking Bob for his presentation.